Welcome to this week's program of Ascend Life on the Autism Spectrum. I'm your co-host Keith Halperin. And I'm Will Burnick. And today our program is Autism and New Job Initiatives in 2018. Uh, but before we begin, Will, what's with your shirt this time? Funny you should ask that. This week's shirt is, is my Chinese New Year shirt. It, it's, it represents Chinese New Year. It's, it's the year of the rooster. And and I'm wearing it because next week is will will officially be Chinese New Year. Today our guest is Kristen Peterson, uh, Chief of Workforce Inclusion at the Arc San Francisco, and she'll be discussing autism and new job initiatives in 2018. Will, would you take it from there, please? Sure. What is your position at at the Arc in, in promoting employment? Um, my position as the chief of services is to um, build corporate relationships with different employer partners throughout the Bay Area, as well as build programming that prepares our client base for workforce success. So not just for their first job, but really to get them onto a career path. How long have you been at the ARC? What were you, what were you doing prior to coming to the ARC? That is a very good question. Um, I have been with the ARC for six years. And all six of those years have been um, focused on workforce inclusion and education. And I've sort of worked my way up from a service manager to now running the program. And prior to um, working for the ARC, I worked at a school for children with autism in Marin, um, particularly focusing on their fundraising and corporate involvement initiatives. Do you work with adults with a variety of developmental differences? What percentage of your clients are on the autism spectrum? So we serve um, over 800 people in the Bay Area um, who have a variety of different developmental um, disabilities or intellectual disabilities. So neurodiversity is really baked into what we do. Um, as far as the percentage of people with an autism diagnosis, I think we're falling around 20% these days, although many of the individuals that we see coming in, particularly to our workforce programs, um, either are on the spectrum or have other disabilities where they would need similar support structures. Have you worked with clients? Have you worked with clients outside of the ARC? I have. That's actually a great question. So we partner with a lot of other workforce development agencies that support individuals with disabilities. We're actually a specialized access point for the Office of Workforce and Economic Development. So other agencies will refer to us. So Lighthouse for the Blind, we work with the Positive Resource Center, Toolworks, um, the Pomeroy Center. So we work with a lot of other partners, um, particularly in some of our large hiring initiatives where we need to hire a large volume of people. We partner with a lot of other agencies to get as many people jobs as possible. Thank you. For our uh, viewers, who may not be familiar with the term, could you tell us what uh, the ARC and your uh, partners mean by inclusion? Absolutely. Um, so when we look at inclusion, we are supporting the individuals who come to us to access every area of adult life. Mm -hmm. So whether that is post-secondary education, community-based living, um, employment being one of our really marquee programs. And what we mean by that is that you are um, not just checking a box. You're not just living next to the real world. Mm -hmm. You are really enmeshed in that community. And really our goal at the ARC is to work ourselves out of a job. Inclusion really should be, um, mm -hmm. should be a natural instinct for humans. And I think we do it really well for certain communities and not as well for others. Mm -hmm. um, San Francisco is such fertile ground to have a really inclusive community. So our goal is that our clients have access to everything any other adult would have access to. Excellent. Uh, can you tell us about some of the uh, companies that have done uh, initiatives up to this point or are in the prospect of doing so? Absolutely. So we work with over 180 employer partners throughout the Bay Area. Um, each of them are very dedicated to inclusion in different ways. Um, but some of the programs that we've seen of late that have been really high impact that I can think of, um, Amazon came to us about 18 months ago looking for a Bay Area disability hiring hub. Mm -hmm. um, and what's really interesting about that program is 
it's not, um, it's really looked at as a staffing solution. It's not necessarily looked at as a corporate social responsibility right. move, although that's a bonus on top of it. Um, and they came to us saying, you know, we have these well-paying part-time jobs with room for advancement that are very high turnover and we're looking for high volume hires. Mm -hmm. um, so the ARC was selected through a competitive RFP process and we have placed 50 individuals um, in the last 12 months Excellent. and are slated to place another 50 before the end of our fiscal year, which is in June, um, in two lines of business, both in sortation, which is sort of a logistics role, and at Prime now here in San Francisco, which is like a grocery shopping rapid fulfillment role. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a little bit more about those two areas and what types of uh, work your uh, successfully pl uh, placed clients have? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, th this project is really interesting for us because we approach it um, very differently than we look at our other employment programs. We're really looked at as a staffing agency mm -hmm. for Amazon. Um, so our interview process, all of that happens with the ARC. Candidates don't have to go to Amazon to interview. We actually set up a small warehouse at our site mm -hmm. so individuals are able to practice the sequence. Um, and what's so interesting to me about that is there are so many people that would really be filtered out by an interview process yes. that are able to be successful overperform in a lot of cases. Um, in the environment of just testing the work out mm -hmm. and then we're able to bring them as kind of gold stamped candidates ready to go and they're pipelined straight in um, our project in newark which is mm -hmm. their sortation center um, basically what they're doing is they're pre-sorting all of the already fulfilled boxes and qaing them to make sure that everything looks okay um, for the postal service and that sortation role makes it possible for your Amazon deliveries to get to you faster. So they're not actually sorted by um, the post office. And they that particular warehouse has anywhere from 250 to 300 people on each shift. And they're responsible for all of the orders for Northern California and Nevada. So they see a lot of movement there, which is great. Um, and in the last year, we've had four of our placements um, get promoted into other Excellent. roles, which is really exciting, um, and have more work orders coming. So that's wonderful. Um, and we're able to partner with a lot of agencies in the East Bay, in, on the peninsula, to fulfill those roles. Here in San Francisco, we're partnering with Prime Now, mm -hmm. which is a much smaller line of business, and that is a rapid fulfillment role. So what they're basically doing is grocery shopping for mm -hmm. you, um, and you're receiving a delivery within two hours. So it's a little bit more of a complicated task. Um, the six individuals that we have working there now, four of them are on the spectrum, and their keen um, attention to detail has made them very competitive Excellent. at that site, which is fantastic. Um, and we continue to see growth there, though it'll be on a much smaller level. It's sort of looking at more like three placements a month versus 13 to 14 in a large warehouse setting. This is really interesting about Amazon. Uh, and now we've been uh, joined by our book correspondent, Jennifer Brooks, who uh, will be participating in the discussion as we go along. Thank you, Keith. Hmm. One thing uh, I'm curious about is besides Amazon, are there other major companies that uh, you'd like to talk about as far as their initiatives this year? Absolutely. Um, one of our other key partners, Salesforce, who we have worked with for over 13 years, actually one of the first 50 hires at Salesforce was an ARC client. Um, we've really been focusing on diversifying roles at Salesforce. We have a couple of roles um, that have become sort of a niche for our organization. And in order for our clients to continue to grow and have more opportunity, we really want to um, expand into different lines of business. And so Salesforce has really um, started an interesting process with us kind of on two different fronts. So locally here at headquarters, as they continue to mm -hmm. expand, um, we are working with different lines of business, including IT, expanding within real estate um, and security and recruiting to look at different opportunities for folks that have worked for Salesforce for a long time and where they can grow. The second thing that we're doing with Salesforce that I'm really excited about is that they would like to replicate their program in different markets. So they've come to the ARC um, as a consulting partner to do the landscape research for them and to find the on the ground support 
um, organizations in Indianapolis, New York, mm-hmm. and London to start with um, so that they're able to replicate the program that we currently have. So for us, it's really exciting to see kind of our impact expanding beyond San Francisco um, and that such a strong corporate leader is coming to an organization like the ARC to have that partnership so that they're doing whatever kind of program rollout they're doing, that it's intentional and really well informed and that they're finding the right partners in those local markets to make it really successful. And those efforts um, will be more pan disability. So we'll be oh, looking okay. at intellectual and developmental disability, um, blindness, and um, individuals who are deaf and hard of hearing. In my day job, I'm a recruiter, so I'm very interested to find out um, how art goes about recruiting people for its various clients. Absolutely. Um, I think one of our most important partnerships with recruiting and where we're seeing a lot of feedback and engagement from our employers is that maybe the way that they're currently recruiting is um, creating unnecessary barriers for a hugely underutilized talent pool. I mean, as a recruiter, you know that um, San Francisco is experiencing its lowest unemployment rate. Um, in recent history that we're below 3% at this point, yet this is a population that, you know, depending on federal numbers that you're looking at, anywhere from 60 to 80% unemployment is about typical um, for a neurodiverse population. And where we can really assist is looking at sort of that systematic um, recruitment structure and traditional recruiting practice and how we can assist recruitment professionals in seeing beyond some of the um, soft skill barriers that may come up um, during an interview process but may not be that relevant to the job or may um, those edges might kind of smooth out once someone is comfortable in an environment. Um, Interviews are a very intense process, I think, for all of us, Um, particularly in tech. They are by design a very intense Mm -hmm. process and at a time where companies are tripping over each other for talent, um, there are a couple of companies that are coming to us saying, how can we be more strategic? How can we be more inclusive in our interview process um, and in our recruiting process to ensure that we're getting the best talent, that we're having high levels of retention, which you know people are moving around so much right now. Um, so we provide a lot of training to recruitment staff, HR staff, Um, to ensure that they have that lens going in, Mm -hmm. that making sure that some of the questions that you're asking or the way that you're looking at how someone's going to join a team and really unpacking that. I think that, you know, historically, and even in our our own organization, um, some of the ways that we looked at hiring really excluded individuals who could be very successful. So it's really an opportunity for thought partnership and sort of a shifting Mm -hmm. of best practice and a review of best practice to ensure that you're getting the most that you can out of the talent pool. Very good. Jennifer, you had a question. Yes, well, speaking of talent, there are many people who do have high levels of talent. I myself have a master's degree in statistics and yeah like you said the traditional recruiting practices whether it was intentional or not are pretty much designed to exclude those people yeah and those people face a double whammy because they think well you have a master's degree you're so smart it should be so easy for you to get a job why don't you have a job what's wrong with you well in that barrier of and to your, your point of a double whammy, if you're also highly educated, then if you're looking to get into something more entry level and work your way up, someone's looking at your resume and thinking you're too highly qualified for a role. So I think um, what we can do as an organization, what we can do as um, sort of a collective and a practice is to really have those conversations with the recruiting staff. Uh, because that's where it's happening and really change what that culture of recruitment looks like. Um, and I think getting the feedback from, you know, we, I can build programs, I can train people all day long, but having the feedback from you, having the feedback from Will of this was my experience, this was where the barrier was created, or this was what I kept hitting. And, um, 
this was how it was sort of structured for me and this is why it was a struggle and letting that feedback really in that real feedback and that real life experience really inform how we are training individuals going forward and how we are um, you know supporting individuals who are looking for work but more importantly working with those professionals who are making the choice of are you a yes or a no Yes. And do you work exclusively with private sector companies or do you work with government agencies too? That's a great question. So we work with everyone. We work with um, primarily corporations um, just because they tend to have better budgets um, and a little more flexibility. But we work very closely with the city of San Francisco. Um, we were on the steering committee for the ACE hiring initiative, um, which is a pipeline for individuals with disabilities to gain city employment. Um, which is wonderful, but it's frankly not enough. There's more that needs to be done there. Um, and we also work with nonprofits. So anyone who employs people, we will work with. Can you talk about workplace culture? Yeah, I think that workplace culture, um, particularly for an organization like ours, you know, when I started, a lot of our narrative was around um, that you're doing the right thing by hiring someone with a disability. And that narrative has really shifted to this is this is not a um, charity move. This is you as a company, you as an organization, finding really qualified talent and having the support of another organization to um, help with that additional runway or any accommodations that someone may need. And we find that we're the most successful um, in cultures where inclusion is really baked in. Mm -hmm. where um, I think about a company like Airbnb, where their theme kind of globally is belonging. And um, their diversity and inclusion lead is the head of diversity and belonging. And I think just that message um, across all layers of staff that you don't need to be the same, you just, you need to be able to be included here. You need to be able to fit here. And I think companies that are really focusing on inclusion, um, you know, there are some tripping points when people look at, is someone a culture fit? And um, I would challenge companies to think about what that actually means to you. Um, I think a lot of the time culture fit means, do they kind of look, act, sound like you? Do you want to grab a beer with them after work? Do they conform to the way the right. brass says you have to be? <laughs> do they look like everybody else? Um, and I think that the cultures that do the best, the cultures that are the most dynamic, have people that look different and act differently and think differently. Um, and a lot of the incredible innovation that we've seen in the Bay Area over the last 50 years has come from that kind of um, diverse and um, sometimes even a little bit fray right of people that aren't doing it the same way everyone else is doing it and that's actually kind of the fuel that's pushing them forward um, one thing that i think is really interesting particularly in tech um i think that millennials kind of get a bad rap right now for moving around too much or um, the way that they're approaching the workforce what i will say about millennials and millennial leadership this is a population of individuals who grew up with inclusion in schools so inclusion is not a hard sell. The idea of someone with a physical disability, a developmental disability, a neurodiverse population, because they've grown up um, with much more exposure and in a much more inclusive education environment, there's no, there's no switch to flip to get mm -hmm. people in. Um, and I have found that when we have partnered with some newer hiring managers, um, they don't have some of like the, the older bad habits that I think all of us have had um, when looking at recruitment. There's so much flexibility um, and there's so much flexibility built into a lot of these jobs right now anyway. You don't have to sit at your desk all day. You can work from the hammock down the hall or sit in the coffee bar and work. Um, so there are so many things that these companies are already doing that I don't know that there's necessarily intention of, oh, by doing this, we're making it um, a better environment for individuals with disabilities, but they're a lot of time de facto making it a better environment. Can you tell us about work, workplace culture and support? 
Yeah, absolutely. So as I had mentioned, I think that um, sometimes younger companies, smaller companies have a little bit more flexibility um, in how they're messaging their culture um, and really how they're embedding that in all of their employees, which makes it an easier entry point. Um, as far as support, I think support is really kind of the cornerstone of what makes our programs work. So we provide job coaching um, at sort of whatever level the individual who's working needs. And a really key part of that job coaching service is to find the natural supports within the organization. So whether that's your supervisor, whether mm -hmm. that's a peer, um, to really help facilitate for our clients kind of knowing who to go to, um, who can be a mentor for you, um, and who can help you navigate sort of the corporate world if that's new to you. Um, and a lot of companies that we work with have that embedded as a practice for all of their employees, whether they have, mm -hmm. you know, some of them have cute names like buddy systems and all kinds of different things. But I think that when that's really embedded in um, the employee onboarding experience, that it makes things a lot smoother. I think the other piece that um, the ARC is really able to kind of bridge the gap on is providing support to managers. I think there are a lot of situations in which managers aren't really sure how to handle a situation. They haven't worked with this population before and may immediately go to, this is not a good fit. Mm -hmm. And by having the job coach and by having um, an extensive team at the ARC, the managers have someone to go to, to kind of work through those issues and really find a solution. Um, and be able to identify whether it's a behavior or um, just sort of like a practice that someone's doing and how we can partner together to kind of make that work. Two final things. First of all, what have you found at the ARC to be the biggest challenge from the uh, corporate side? And then finally, what things do you see upcoming initiatives or programs or changes uh, in 2018. Absolutely. You know, um, I think I've talked a lot about all of the positives that are happening and all of that is very real. Um, but the fact that organizations like ours have to exist shows us mm -hmm. that there's still a lot of work to do. And I think some of the biggest barriers that we face are um, misconception and fear. I think that there are a lot of companies that um, have a very strong diversity and inclusion game, if you will, um, a really strong narrative, and they're not really sure how to do it. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there um, are still a lot of misconceptions around what working with a person with a disability is going to look like. I think there's a lot of misconception about liability. Um, and we spend a lot of time working with our employer partners to unpack that, to kind of create a safe space mm -hmm. around, so what are the real questions that you have? Because I think people are so afraid to say the wrong thing that sometimes they just don't touch it. Yes. Um, another thing that I think has been really helpful for us in eliminating those barriers is partnering some of our employers. Um, so taking, you know, an employer that does enterprise, um, customer tracking mm -hmm. like Salesforce and connecting them with another similar organization or connecting Deloitte where we've had a lot of success with PwC who's interested um, and allowing for them to have that business to business relationship and that business to business conversation um, because I think sometimes people are afraid to ask me or my staff questions depending on mm -hmm. you know <laughs> what the question may be um, and I also think having that business to business conversation um, allows for that like brass tax bottom line. Is this going to cost us more money? What is the ROI? Do people really stay? And that they're able to have um, that conversation. But I, I would say our biggest barriers are still kind of misconception. Mm -hmm. and, and I think the thought that you're going to have to create sort of special jobs for special people. Um, there's, that's not what accommodation is about. That's not what inclusion is about. Um, so uh, I feel like a lot of the advice that I give to our employers sometimes is to stop overthinking it. You're just looking, you're looking for someone to meet your business mm -hmm. needs. That is the conversation that we're having right now. Um, as far as things that are coming up in 2018, we're really looking at different emerging, emerging markets, whether it be sort of the gig economy or, um, rapid fulfillment, some of the other jobs that are coming up there. 
um, and really looking at how we can embed ourselves in these larger diversity and inclusion conversations because our programs are often separate from or sort of to the side of a larger diversity and inclusion initiative. Mm -hmm. um, I think some other things that we will see coming up um, are some interesting opportunities in tech, particularly in IT support, um, where we have a handful of companies that are doing time studies right now um, on kind of bringing in tech support at a more entry level that has opportunity for growth with or without a college degree. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we see this in workforce workforce development across the board, no matter what population you're working with, um, that encouraging companies to look at these alternative pipelines is only gonna make their company stronger. And looking at certain barriers, whether it be a driver's license or a master's degree or a mm -hmm. college degree, um, and really unpacking why that's a requirement. Um, so I see our role as continuing to advocate for, um, you know, looking and tapping into these talent pools um, going forward. So I think 2018 is going to be an exciting one for us. It certainly sounds like that. You have been a wonderful guest. And thank we you. thank you very much for your time. Thank and you for we would love me. to have you back in the future. I would love to come back. Thank you very much, Kristen Peterson. Thank you. And now we'll hear from our book correspondent, Jennifer Brooks. Thank you, Keith. In honor of Valentine's Day, I'd like to tell you about two books that deal with the subject of romantic relationships. The first is called Loving Mr. Spock by Barbara Jacobs. This is the story of her relationship with a man named Danny, who unbeknownst to both of them, was on the autism spectrum. Now, spoiler alert, the couple did not live happily ever after. The relationship was a failure, but the book is still valuable, especially because in addition to telling her own story, Barbara also writes a neurotypicals guide to understanding people with autism. So if you can only read one book on the subject, this would be an excellent choice. Throughout the book, Barbara includes quotes from a variety of people on the spectrum describing their experiences. Unfortunately, one of them is not Danny himself. That's the book's only serious flaw, but still highly recommended. Second is a book that both Barbara and Danny could have benefited from reading and studying. It's called Romantic Intelligence. This book is aimed at people who have high levels of intellectual intelligence but aren't so good at dealing with things like human emotions and human relationships. That describes a lot of people on the autism spectrum, including Danny. And the reason why this book is so useful is because it's not only an all-purpose guide to how to form a successful relationship, it also includes various exercises throughout. Let's see if I could. All right, here we go. Here is a compatibility checklist. It includes items such as, my partner and I have discussed our expectations of how things should work in a relationship, i.e. chores, finances, and family obligations. So, yes, one of the things that it's important for couples to agree on, any couple, whether they're neurotypical or otherwise would have a difficult time forming a successful relationship if they couldn't agree on something like that. So very useful book, very highly recommended. Thank you. Well, folks, that's our show for this week. Uh, as we are filming, uh, we've got upcoming uh, Valentine's Day for all of you who are uh, in a romantic relationship of some sort to have a wonderful time. And beyond that, uh, we're also, as Will's t-shirt said, upcoming uh, Chinese New Year. So for those in the community, Hong Hei Bar Choi. Once again, I'm Keith Halperin. I'm Will Burnick. I'm Kristen Peterson. And I'm Jennifer Brooks. And that's it this week for, for Life on the Autism Spectrum. Take care. Mm -hmm.